Uh, hello, everyone. Good afternoon in Germany and good morning in US to Dr. Dean and Dr. Florian and Dr. Francie. Very nice to meet you. Um, I will be presenting on three cases, uh, like Dr. Uh, Robin sa said, uh, three cases of dilated dorsal cephalic vein causing different issues uh, managed in different ways. But uh, let me start my presentation with this beautiful panoramic picture taken by Robin sir, uh, which shows the new pediatric white building, which uh, CTVS has been using quite frequently these days because of a lot of pediatric thoracic cases. So uh, I will be talking about three cases of uh, cephalic vein, and if Dr. Manoj will join, he will be talking to you about uh, um, an interesting case of uh, uh, venous malformation with uh, varicosities. So before getting into that, uh, we have tried, uh, our department has tried to uh, improve uh, on uh, a few things based on the feedback we received from the last visit by Dr. Florin, uh, Dr. Mike, and Dr. Dean. And so we have actively tried to increase the number of cases and also tried to increase the number of fistula cases. Um, one of the problems was uh, a lot of OTs would be canceled because of uh, inadequate or inappropriate preoperative uh, assessment uh, and 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 to counter uh, to 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 uh, to deal with that. What we have done uh, these days is that we uh, admit all of our. Uh, if not, uh, we have, we admit most of our preoperative cases, if not all of them, and uh, we we do a thorough preoperative assessment, uh, not just investigation, but also uh, vascular mapping and all those things, marking and everything, uh, and surgical planning one day prior to surgery. And uh, so this was uh, this is a stat that I uh, uh, extracted from our OT record book uh, today in OT. And it seems like in the last six weeks, uh, we've done a total of uh, 14 uh, new fistula creation and uh, five transposition of basilic vein. And among those five, there were cases where um, fistula was made during Dr. Dean's time. Uh, fistula, which were made during Dr. Florian's time, I think they've, they've already been transposed in the, in the past. So before the, these six weeks. So just to make sure that uh, the presentation is uniform, so uh, to ensure uniformity in presentation, I will be calling uh, the branch of uh, or, or the cephalic vein that goes into the, the distal arm as the dorsal dorsal branch of cephalic vein. Uh, Netters here has named the uh, this vein as the cephalic vein, and the vein that is formed from. Uh, uh, like the joining of median anti-brachial and cephalic as uh, it has not given any name for that, but uh, for, for our presentation, for our purpose, we're going to call it the dorsal branch of cephalic vein. So uh, if it's okay with all of us, I would like to present all of these three cases at once. And at the end of the presentation, uh, we could discuss on the similarities and the differences and uh, uh, what what we could have done better in our approach. So let me begin with uh, this uh, lady, a 32-year-old female patient uh, with CKD on the dialysis. Uh, she had problems with her dialysis, uh, uh, decreased flow during dialysis for which she was evaluated, I think, by Nobin, sir, and uh, uh, who found out that she had a thrombosis in her left cephalic vein. Uh, and that was causing problems with her dialysis. So uh, I think Nobin, sir, put in a uh, IJ catheter in her right, uh, right side. Uh, but when she came to us, she had uh, new complaints. She had uh, complaints of pain, swelling, and blackish discoloration of her left hand. So on examination, so this picture was taken on the OT table, not in the OPD, but I have a picture of, uh, of when we first saw her. Her left hand was visibly swollen, edematous. Uh, the skin was darkened uh, distal to the wrist. And um, uh, the fistula, uh, previous, uh, the scar of previous fistula surgery was, was, was present over the elbow. 
And on palpation, uh, we could feel uh, a thrill over the uh, cephalic vein uh, at the anastomotic site. And also a thrill was present on the dorsal cephalic vein, the dorsal branch of cephalic vein. But uh, uh, only pulsations were present in the proximal part of cephalic vein, and that too uh, was, was, was not good enough uh, uh, as we went higher up in the arm. So we did a, a, a vascular ultrasound in the OPT itself, and we saw, uh, as noted previously, there was a thrombus in, in the proximal part of the cephalic vein, but the dorsal cephalic vein was also dilated. And uh, this is not to say that the dorsal cephalic vein was dilated throughout its length, but near the anastomosis, just a few centimeters below the elbow, up to a few centimeters below the elbow, it was uh, as big as 6.2 millimeters. And uh, the smallest size was about 3, 3.5 3 millimeters in diameter. And uh, in spectral Doppler examination, we could see that uh, there was a fistulous flow in the dorsal cephalic vein. And another interesting thing was the basilic vein was also uh, dilated, which means that flow, uh, the blood flow, because it was not able to go into the uh, proximal part of the cephalic vein, it was being diverted into the dorsal as well as the, uh, uh, the basilic vein. Now, this was on presentation, we had given her an OT date uh, for maybe two weeks later, uh, but she came back to us again in just a few days of time. And now her complaints were, were that uh, the pain and swelling had increased. And uh, previously she, her pain, uh, you know, she rated her pain as about like, let's say five or six out of 10. Now, sometimes it was as, as severe as seven or eight out of 10. So uh, we had to give her an OT date for much earlier. And uh, so, so we did that. And uh, so our approach to treating this uh, case was um, based on our USC findings and clinical examination findings. Uh, we, we concluded that she was having problems due to venous hypertension. And that was because of uh, dilation of the dorsal cephalic vein, which was uh, in turn because of the thrombosis that was occluding the blood flow. And uh, what we thought was if we can uh, reroute the blood flow, if we can remove the dorsal cephalic vein and then uh, recourse it and anastomose it with the basilic vein, which is also uh, dilating, so which is also maturing, then she might be, we might be able to salvage this fistula. So that is what we did. And this is uh, just before the operation. Uh, this is the uh, site of anastomosis. This is the proximal part of cephalic vein. This is around the reason where the thrombus started with almost uh, complete occlusion to blood flow. This is where the dorsal part of the cephalic vein uh, took its origin. And uh, it it went uh, along the forearm into the wrist. So uh, these are where we planned the incision, and we uh, uh, we 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 gave skipped incisions, and we removed uh, the cephalic vein, ligated it, tunneled through the skin, and then uh, looped it around and anastomosed it with the basilic vein. So this picture is. Uh, uh, just uh, a comparison between the uh, uh, the first initial visit. So this is when she came to us for the first time. And this is right after the OT, just after the dressing was applied. And as we were about to shift the patient to the post-op ward, uh, her, her swelling uh, decreased a lot. As we can see uh, uh, on our first visit, on our first visit, the uh, hand was visibly swollen, the skin was taut, the hand was firm, it was tender. Uh, uh, now the hand looks uh, really, uh, it, it does not look as taut and it felt a uh, little soft. Uh, while pain could not be assessed because uh, this OT was done in uh, brachial block. But in the first post-operative day, she, she also reported uh, having less pain now. And this patient was discharged and uh, this is about two weeks after discharge, and um, the scar, the scar from the uh, surgery was healthy, 
this right here is the previous anastomotic site. Again, this is the thrombosed part of the proximal cephalic vein. And this is what we have looped. And uh, this is the new anastomotic, ar around the region of the new anastomotic site. And this is now the new dilated uh, basilic vein. So this, that was about the first case. The second case is of a 57-year-old male patient. Uh, this so patient we, had... We should probably... I just have a couple questions. Right. Um, it's okay if I interrupt? Yes. No, that's okay. Pretty. I'm going to do it anyway. So. <laughs> so I'm just, the dorsal vein, um, you're calling, and what you're showing me and what you're calling the dorsal vein on your netter pictures, you were looking, it looked like you were looking at the palmar side or the volar side, yet your operation was indeed the dorsal vein. So, I mean, I'm just, if you write this up, I mean, just so you have your definitions right. Mm -hmm. And uh, so great. I think your approach, your understanding of the problem and your approach in my head, very good. You know, new reroute. I mean, this is this was one way of doing it. There were, there were maybe some other options, but I think this one's a great one. Uh, how long has it been since this operation? About uh, two months now. Because it looks like... Yes, sir. They're accessing mm -hmm. it in your group? Uh, uh, right not in this picture. Yeah, this this picture is... Uh, this is showing the scar from the surgery. But yes, uh, they, they are putting needles now in, in this part of the vein and also in this part. Okay. Dilated basilic as well as previous uh, cephalic fee. All right. Yeah, which I think was the initial idea, right? Because the other part was the thrombosed. And if you activate the basilic vein, then um, you would actually have to transpose it. But um, by uh, doing this reroute, um, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a good option of, of actually having another epifacial uh, vein. So I agree with Dean. It's, it's a it's very nicely done, and the idea behind it is very good too. And th there's just one thing I, I don't like about um, your photos; they are always like distorted, or so it's it, it's very difficult to have a, to see a before and after, and and really imagine uh, what what it looks like. So I I don't actually think that this arm looks as it does on this photo because it's it's I don't know it's it's uh, somewhat. Yeah, it, yes, it, it looks yeah, it looks much better on the patient's yeah. hand. So, <laughs> yeah, so but but you know what? I mean, you all have good cameras. Why why not take? I mean, on the on the smartphone, just just take better photos. You know that that's all yeah. I I would advise. But um, apart from that, yeah, definitely, it's it's a really good idea and interesting too. Yeah, the yeah, other, I mean, just for what it's worth, I mean, the photo it looks like it's just stretched out. So actually, you just gotta mm -hmm. shrink it back down, and the arm will look normal. Yeah, that could be yes. too. Yeah. Yeah. But Florian's right. I mean, I did a case uh, just this week and I wished I had taken good photos. So it's just something to keep in mind. Yeah. Okay, maybe so maybe now uh, our department needs a dedicated camera now. No, nah, it's, it's high. Nah. No, 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 no. You don't need your phone works good. <laughs> like what, like what I'm getting at is when you and myself, I made the mistake this week. When we see unusual things, we should make sure we get good photos. That's, I think, the message that Florian's trying to give. Florian is also saying that we don't need to stress the pictures. So yeah. this yeah. picture is also slightly stressed. So yeah. that's that. Yeah. Yeah. But you were smart. Okay. Get, but you were smarter than me. You got the picture. I forgot to get a picture. <laughs> All right. Great. I think that's a great case. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Dean. Um, so is it okay if I proceed with the next case? So so this uh, guy was a 57-year-old patient, again, uh, a known case of uh, CKD, under dialysis once a week uh, in uh, during his initial presentation. So his problem was, his fistula was made about one year back, left-sided brachiocephalic fistula. And his only problem was uh, 
uh, again decreased flow during dialysis, but dialysis was 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 being done from the same fistula. And um, so we examined him this time. No signs of venous hypertension, no edema, no swelling, no nothing. Not even dilated veins in the arm. However, um, when we uh, when we did an ultrasound, we saw that uh, there was one branch. I'm I'm really sorry, I don't have the ultrasound pictures here, and this is after uh, the ultrasound examination. This was marked after ultrasound. So so this is the previous anastomotic site, the proximal uh, cephalic vein, and then the dorsal branch. Again, uh, this dorsal branch was dilated. But one interesting thing that we noticed in this patient was this dorsal branch, uh, branch appeared to be connected to the basilic vein. Now, obviously, ultrasound examination has its own limitations. So we thought we should further investigate. And uh, so what we did was we asked the patient to come for uh, a fistulogram. And this is the picture from, from, from that. Again, I'm really sorry I could not uh, take, uh, the pictures could have been much better if I uh, took it out from, from the computer. Uh, and also, please don't mind my hand right there. I was holding this butterfly cannula, putting in contrast. And as we can see here, I, I cannulated the cephalic vein and what we can notice here is the the flow is, is it's not going towards the cephalic vein it's going into the dorsal cephalic vein and then uh, which is naturally looping into the basilic vein and the basilic vein was dilated and all of the flow was going through the basilic vein now i i think this is the reason why uh, dialysis was uh, was possible but also this is the reason why the stenosis in the cephalic vein was the reason why uh, uh, he had problems with flow during dialysis. Again, in this picture, we can see uh, really poor flow from the cephalic vein, but could flow from the basilic vein. Now, in this patient, uh, like before, what we uh, uh, what we thought was we 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 should transpose the basilic vein because uh, that 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 is one of the options for salvaging this fistula because uh, there is flow into the basilic vein and the basilic vein is dilating but uh, 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 there were two reasons why we didn't do it right then and there the first reason was he didn't need dialysis as frequently as the other uh, patients do only once a week and that too it, it was uh, quite infrequent and the second thing was again logistically uh, we were not able to give him a, an immediate OT date so he had to wait for a few weeks so until then we advised him for uh, regular handball physiotherapy so after two weeks this patient comes to us anxious tells us that his nephrologist uh, has asked him that maybe they should now start increasing the frequency of dialysis. And his son was uh, very anxious. He, he wanted us to operate on him and transpose the basilic vein so that, you know, after a few weeks, uh, they could use that vein for dialysis. But the good thing uh, on, uh, on that day was... Um, uh, his basilic vein was uh, it was it was more than six mm in diameter, and uh, a few uh, like a small portion of this dorsal cephalic vein and the distalmost portion of the basilic vein was quite superficial. So we thought we would be able to cannulate uh, this vein for dialysis. This guy was lucky that he was uh, undergoing dialysis at our hospital. So Satisar himself, he went to uh, the dialysis uh, session and he showed uh, our, our staff where to cannulate. And um, turns out uh, uh, dialysis was possible from cannulation without uh, even transposition based on his anatomy. Uh, uh, but uh, again, uh, uh, there's something that I want to discuss and ask you after I finish with the third case. We don't know how uh, how long this dorsal cephalic vein is going to be patent enough uh, and when this patient would require a re-anastomosis of the basilic vein into the uh, brachial artery and then transposition. But for now, at least, uh, he's undergoing dialysis two times a week and uh, with without any problems. So that was uh, another case. Uh, third and case was. Uh, I think uh, we yeah. can discuss this case now and continue. Right. Okay. Yeah.
Now, I think I think we should discuss them one at a time, yeah. right? Yeah. Because I can't remember that long by the time you do all this. <laughs> Florine, do you want to comment first? Well, for, for, I like the picture of the arm, but I don't like that hand on the, as you said. You know? <laughs> and you, I know that you notice, uh, that you, yeah. and this is why you mentioned it directly. Um, yeah. Otherwise, um, I... It's it's an interesting case again. My my question is, why did the cephalic um, vein not mature, and why did it actually mature into this interesting, uh, yeah, the, the dorsal vein, which then uh, uh, and the or, or went um, go goes into the basilic. So, what is the reason for it? Is there a central stenosis? So, brilliant. Uh yeah. No, not not so there was the stenosis stenosis of the, the proximal yeah yeah stenosis the, 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 the deep stenosis. Patent, yeah the deep vein is patent but i mean is there a, a proximal stenosis not the central a proximal yeah sorry. proximal uh, yeah. florian uh, the that cephalic vein was also used by nephrologists but something related to cannulation some issues that's why it got it got thrombosed okay and okay. then uh, the new uh, the flow was diverted to another branch yeah, okay. Well, that's, that's really interesting. And the picture we see shows uh, some some narrow parts in that, in that, yeah, in that, um, yeah that, that we'll extra see. vein. But I think actually, and I don't know if you agree, Dean, or if you uh, contradict, I think as long as you can do cannulation, it still has the chance of maturing. I mean, even that part of the vein. And so I think for the moment, I wouldn't do anything. <clears throat> So I'm going to ask a question. I so you're putting two needles in. I assume one needle they're putting in where you have your butterfly, and this right. so that's where they're drawing out. That's the arterial and and the re venous return is in that dorsal vein. Is that right? Uh, not in the dorsal vein specifically, but in the the distal most part of the basilica, yeah, which is which is quite superficial. Uh, well, one I I think it's great. You know, you figured it out. Uh, I think you don't have, you're right. I think it's great that Satish went, you know, to the dialysis unit, showed him where to put the needles. Florian's right. There's those stenotic areas, but you know, that increases the pressure in the arterial uh, one. And uh, as long as you have venous return, you can use this thing for as long as you want. Those stenotic areas may improve or they may not. And then in the future, you can always transpose that basilic vein. So I would use this as long as you can. You know, be <clears throat> and it right, at some point it may fail. In all likelihood, it'll fail. And then you do your transposition and the patient will need a temporary catheter for a while. But if you were to transpose it now, they would need a catheter. So, yeah. Why, yeah, but why Dean, do you that now? Huh? Yeah, but Dean, why, why even, um, and, or why do you think is there a need for the catheter? Because if you you have this this diversion, so maybe you can actually use this um, until it's uh, until the, the 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 scar has has healed and you can use the transposed vein. Oh, um, oh, oh, you mean okay, right? I get yeah. What, in, in case of, of of failure, yeah, you're right. Yeah. So. Mm, well, because yes. if you if you transpose it now, you're going yeah. to do a new arterial anastomosis, right? Yeah. But maybe you can transpose it and use the the arc on the you know the dorsal vein to do ah. dialysis. You know, don't use the basilic vein for dialysis access. Transpose yeah. it and just use the dorsal vein. Yeah, but Dean just said then you need you might need a new anastomosis. Yes, but, you do, uh, but. You have the transposition, you have the basilic vein, mm -hmm. and you have the arc, and then you can do the yeah, dialysis but, over the arc. Yeah, but and then, Dean, what Dean means is that if you take that arc, you interrupt it because you have to create a new anastomosis, and then there's no yeah. outflow of this arc. Mm -hmm. But you don't actually have to necessarily do that. You can actually transpose it without uh, creating a new... Well, but that would make sense. No? no. She says Sorry. No. Well, you'll figure it out. You may or may not need a catheter. We won't, we won't. <laughs> Depends on where you make the anastomosis, things like that. So Francie may well be right too. 
depends where you make the anastomosis, right? Yeah. You might be able to use some of what is already superficial, I think is what she is saying. No, if I'm you... saying now, as long as it works, why don't you do the transposition of the basilic vein and just use the arc? You know, you don't need a catheter then. Well, that's, <clears throat> so you're saying do the transposition now. Yeah. And, you know, that is a possibility. Then you have like a long distance for cannulation, you know. You have and the dorsal vein for cannulation, and once it heals, you have the basilic vein for cannulation. Yeah, but the, the thing is, this one drains into the basilic vein. Yeah. So if the, the idea is if you create a new anastomose because there are some stenotic areas in this inflow, then um the basilic vein might fail in the long term. Mm. That's the idea behind it. So, but if you create a new anastomose to have a good inflow into the transposed basilic vein, then you interrupt this this arc. Yeah, that's. Yeah. But I I think also what Francie is saying is you could do the transposition now. Um, and because you're still going to have inflow, but if that stenotic area occludes, that whole basilic vein will. Look a clot because now you don't have side branches feeding into it to help mm -hmm. keep it patent so you might lose the whole system mm -hmm. it's just i'm just it's it's a i think i just keep using it as it is yeah when the flow goes down transpose it put a catheter in and you only need a catheter for four weeks you know don't leave it in forever because it's already maturing it's already big You'd probably, after transposing it, only need a catheter for four weeks. Sure, doctor. It's still... sure. Anyway. But yeah, I think there's a lot of good things here. So you're smart with how you figured it out. Uh, I like the pictures other than your hand. And uh, yeah, perfect. Thank you. Thank you so okay. much. Uh, yeah. So, um, I'll, I'll quickly discuss about the third case. Now, this patient we did only last week. Um, one problem in this case is uh, uh, the evaluation and OT, we didn't take a lot of time. So maybe I felt like we didn't evaluate this patient enough uh, because uh, uh, I'll, I'll quickly run you through this case. This patient uh, came to us uh, only last week, maybe on Sunday, uh, with complaints of pain and swelling. Uh, in the left hand and also blackish discoloration of his hand below wrist and also a dilated dorsal branch of cephalic vein and interestingly this patient was referred to us by our first case the first case that we discussed that lady and this patient underwent uh, they undergo dialysis in the same center and uh, she recognized the problem and she sent uh, sent this guy to our hospital uh, so this is the picture that we took before the OT. Again, similar looking dilated dorsal vein with uh, uh, edematous hand, uh, black fingers, and also uh, skin ulceration uh, over the over the fingers. And in this patient, uh, I was not able to palpate radial and ulnar pulses as well. And this patient was complaining with, uh, uh, complaining about a lot of uh, pain as well but the problem with this patient was he didn't have a lot of money or time he came for a, from a very uh, far away place uh, and then also uh, he didn't have a lot of money for all workup so we we did want to work him up for maybe any central venous pathology because there was no obvious pathology in his proximal cephalic vein un unlike the previous two cases because his fistula, fistula was functioning. So we were suspecting he might be having some central venous pathologies, but we were not able to work him up. The only thing that we were able to do was uh, a USG up to the proximal part of the cephalic vein, up to the uh, cephalic subclavian junction. And uh, up to there, we, we could not find out any thrombosis, stenosis, any uh, uh, problems with uh, flow velocity. However, we don't know if this patient has any central venous pathologies. We don't know why this dilated. But for this patient, because his fistula, fistula was functioning and there was adequate length of proximal cephalic vein, and his only problem was dil dilation and pain in his left, uh, left hand because of venous hypertension, uh, we decided to 
uh, ligate the dorsal uh, cephalic vein and uh, immediately uh, he was relieved of the pain and also the swelling subsided like in the first case and uh, we did this case in local anesthetics again because of uh, uh, economic issues he he could not afford a lot of ot charges so local anesthesia we, we ligated the vein uh, uh, the, the procedure was simple really fast and uh, then we were able to assess the pain this time and uh, he, he he said that um, uh, his pain decreased a lot. Also, the swelling decreased a lot. We put in compressing, compression bandaging, and then we discharged the patient. We haven't seen him in follow up yet. Uh, maybe we will. Uh, we, he will come to us this week, and I, I'll be happy to share his pictures in in the WhatsApp group if he comes back to us. So, uh, based on these three uh, cases, what I've learned is. When we make a uh, let's, if I... let's discuss the third case, and then you can tell us what you learned. Yeah. Is that okay? Yeah. Is okay. <laughs> so we have four minutes left. Who's going to lead the discussion this time, Francie or Swesha or Sanjay? <laughs> Dr. Dean. Me? Yeah. So one thing you could have done... In, um, as I think about this, you say you had limited time or you didn't want to do a fistulogram and so on. By physical exam, what do you think you could have done to know that what you did was going to work? Well, one thing is if we could see dilated uh, veins in his chest, maybe that would be uh, another sign that is a central venous uh, pathology. Okay. And if we don't address that, uh, I, I don't think this is going to work. All right. What else? What else would tell you that it would work or not work? Uh, maybe by maybe by uh, compression so, bandage. Yeah. So what I would do, or what you could have done, was just take your thumb or your finger, occlude that dorsal vein, and listen with the stethoscope to the fistula. Is there still a great brewery? If there's still a great brewery with tons of diastolic flow, in all likelihood, there's not an outflow stenosis. So you do feel for if it's pulsatile and listen to it and listen to the character of the, the brewery with it compressed and not compressed. So if you compress that, that dorsal vein and now you're hearing this as opposed to tons of diastolic flow, well, that's another thing that would tell you that there's a central stenosis. But if you got tons of flow during diastole, in all likelihood, there's there's great outflow. Francie, what do you Swetcha, Francie, Sanjay, what do you think? Notice I didn't ask Florian. <laughs> so, Dr. D, will it reconnect if it disconnects, okay? What did she say, Robin? I didn't get that. No, it's once we disconnect, we'll connect in the same link. Okay. 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 Yeah. 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 But or, we'll have to wait for nine minutes. I guess a question now would be: Is how is the thrill in brewing now that you ligated? Because is there a great thrill and is there a great brewing? So yeah. Uh, actually, yeah. yeah. After ligation, uh, the thrill was good. We we the and thrill was palpated up to the uh, proximal cephalic up to the uh, proximal arm. So, so there's just one remark I have, um, um, Mandeep. You said uh, the patient was not uh, uh, fluent, couldn't afford uh, um, a regional anastomosis. I think for such ligation, you definitely don't need more than just a local, you know. It's, it's as you said, it's an easy procedure, you know, little incision, you just ligate it and that's it. So don't do a big regional or even a, a general anesthesia. And you were smart to uh, put a compression dressing on that forearm because when that vein clots, they're going to get a bad thrombophlebitis. So you want to wrap that thing. So hopefully they don't get a bad thrombophlebitis in there. Hmm. Keep the, you know, compress that as much as you can. So Dr. Dean, as you said, uh, before surgery, we ensure uh, the thrill in cephalic is good. Like before uh, ligating the 
dorsal branch, we checked the uh, thrill vesicali after we looked the uh, gene. So our one question is what was the reason for this dorsal vein to be this big? Because the flow was going to the cephalic vein itself. 